Amen. Amen. Thank you, Brother Mike. We really appreciate that. Bless your heart. Okay, Brother Ron, it's time to open the Lord's Word and see what he has for us this evening. We welcome you and we thank you for being here. Thank you. Pat. Good evening. Good evening. Um, if you would like the title, if you're taking notes. Um, I labeled this as Worthy is Our God. And um, the primary message is actually about church. And um, if you're a born again believer, you and I are part of the body of Christ. And church is supposed to be the body of Christ coming together to worship God as one unit. You can't do that watching us online. We're glad you're watching, and perhaps you can get a flavor of it. But if you're a born-again believer, you belong in an assembled body of believers. You need to be found in church. That's where God, God set this up for us. And yet, people take it very lightly about being in church. As you guys know, if you look around, we've only got about half of the people that we would have Sunday morning, here on Thursday night, Sunday night, and quite often Sunday school. Where are the others? They profess to be believers. And I'm not pointing a finger at anybody. I'm just saying, look, we are the body of Christ. We're supposed to be together to worship him to honor him and to glorify him. That's our responsibility. That's what we are to do as a body. And I look at the clock and I may have to shorten some of this. Uh, if you would, please turn with me to the book of Hebrews, chapter 10. We'll look at just two verses there, verses 24, 24 and 25. Hebrews 10, 24, the Bible says, and let us consider, that means to, to fully observe, to take a good look at something, consider it. And let us consider one another to provoke. Now, I want you to hold on to that word provoke because we're gonna look at it. One another to provoke and to love and to good works. You and I are to be excited about God's good work in us and through us. Let us consider one another to provoke. That word provoke in the Greek, now I may mispronounce this because I am not a Greek scholar, but comes from, the, from a Greek word paroxymus from which we get our English word paroxysm, which means a sudden attack or violent expression of a particular emotion or activity. You and I are to be excited and to encourage the other believers to be excited. Not, not a fake emotion, but from the heart. I'm supposed to be excited about what, about what my God is doing for me, for this body, for individual souls. Yet we walk around sometimes like we're numb to it. I, I'm as bad as the rest of the others. I'm speaking to myself too. Let us consider one another emotionally driven. Our hearts involved unto love and good works. 
Verse 25, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is. In other words, some people forsake the gathering together. You and I, as the body of Christ, are supposed to be here. If we're believers, we're supposed to be here. And the word of God tells us some will not do that. And God tells us, do not forsake that, the gathering. Don't do it. Yet, we have people that do it. But exhorting one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching, what, the last days. As we see the last days coming up on us, we know it's not far ahead. In fact, we're in the last days waiting for the last day. God says, this is not the time to not be found in church together. Don't stay home. My nose is running. Well, let it run in church. <laughs> Call everyone into gathering. Encourage those that aren't showing up. You don't have to be mean about it. We're to do this in love. Come on, why don't you go to church with me tonight? I know you don't normally go on Thursday night, but why don't you come and join us? That's what we're supposed to be. We're his body. He designed it. He made us. This is what God wants. His body together worshiping him. I can't do that if I'm sitting in my living room. I can't do it with you guys. I mean, I can worship him alone, but I can't do it as a body. I've got to be here with you, and you have to be here with me. God's will for each one of us is to be an active member in the body of Christ worshiping and praising him as one body. And we can't do that unless we're here. We can't. Now you can have all kinds of excuses. It doesn't matter, God says be here. Now if you're having a heart attack and you're in the ER, I can see, you know, well, uh, you got a good reason for not being here. But not everyone that's not here tonight is having a heart attack in the ER. I'd like to look at what a church should be like tonight. And don't be offended, it's not for friendship. It's not a club. It's to worship, honor, and praise our Lord and Master and to learn of him, to be instructed of him. That's the whole point of being together. God says, you're my body. Doesn't matter if you're a fingernail or an eyelash, it doesn't matter. God says, you're my body and you're supposed to be here. By the way, we use the term, but it's not, it's not correct. This is not my church, and this is not your church. This is his church. We use it, oh, where's, what church do you go to? What, what church is your church? Well, it isn't our church. And you know what? A lot of churches are our church, and that's a mistake. It's supposed to be his church, his body. Not mine. Sorry, don't mean to be getting after you, but this is what God gave me tonight. If you would, the church is 100% his. It's not 1% mine and his. No, it's his body. If you would, please turn with me to Psalm 95. Psalm 95, starting in verse 3. 
Christ bought this with his own blood. He owns us as a body, lock, stock, and barrel, and he owns us individually, lock, stock, and barrel. If you're a real believer, you are his. Psalm 95, starting in verse 3, For the Lord is a great God, a great king above all gods, little g. In his hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it. In his hands form the dry ground. Oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us, you and I, kneel before the Lord. And that, that word Lord there is Jehovah Yahweh, our maker. You and I are to willfully fall down before him in reverence, in humbleness, when I look at, at who he is, and I look at who I am, the real me, the one that I gotta live with every day, I should be falling down. For he is, for he is our God. He's not my buddy. He's not the man upstairs. I hate that term. He's my God, and he's my Savior. And we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Today, if ye will hear his voice, it's all about him. In Matthew 16, 18, you don't have to turn there, but it's just one verse. And I say also unto thee, thou art Peter. You're Peter. You're a little stone, like a pebble. You're a little stone. And upon this rock, this massive foundational boulder, speaking of Christ himself, I will build my church. The church isn't built on Peter, it's built on Christ, my Savior, the one who we are the body of. His body is in heaven now, and you and I have the privilege of representing him as his living, breathing body on earth. Acts 2, 47, just one verse. Praising God and having favor with all people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. It's his body, it's his church, and he's the one who adds to it. Praise God, there's never a subtracting. You can't lose your salvation. He adds to it. It doesn't say anything at all about subtracting from it. We're his body. It's where we come together as one, as a single unit to praise and to worship him, to thank him for his saving grace and his daily care for me. You know where I would be probably if I never got saved? The way I was going, I'd more than likely, instead of standing here before you, would have been a drunk. Isn't that worth thanking God for? I'm here as a saved living son of God. Not the son of God, a son of God. By his grace, not by anything I did. In Acts chapter 7, verse 37, I'm skipping a little bit here, but 
trying to pick up the high points. Acts 7.37 says, This is that Moses which said, said unto the children of Israel, A prophet shall the Lord your God raise up unto you of your brethren. Like unto me, he, him shall ye hear. This is he that was in the church in the wilderness with the angel which spake unto him in Mount Sinai and with our fathers who received the living oracles to give unto us to whom our fathers would not obey but thrust them from them and in their hearts turned back again unto Egypt. Egypt, picturing world worldliness. God rescued them and their heart was back into the world like uh, Lot's wife. She had to look back why her heart was back there. If you look around today, you can see what man's church looks like. A church without Christ as the head. A church where the body is not interested in Christ. It's pretty common, even at a lot of Baptist churches. Have you ever walked into a church and man, you're there just a few minutes and you know that there is life. God has given life and you can feel it. You sense it when you talk to the believers. I haven't experienced that too many times, but I have and thank God for it. What is the difference there? And you walk into a church and people say hi, but there's, you know, and they're smiling and they're glad to greet you and there's no life. What is the difference? One body is celebrating the God that saved their souls from the depths of their heart, not just a surface thing. One church has got a living, breathing savior being stirring their hearts and their lives. And the other one goes to church. Oh, we might have a couple outreaches. We might do things. But where is Christ in the heart? So what I want to look at, I'm going to take a few minutes, so we may go a little bit longer than five after or whatever, trying to turn to Revelation chapter four. Now this one, we're going to look at several verses. What I want to see is what does a church service really supposed to be like? And you know what? John tells us what a heavenly surface, uh, service is. I think if heaven's got it right, it might be a good blueprint. What do you think? God is there with them. All right, Revelation chapter 4, starting in verse 1. After this, I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was that it were of a trumpet talking to me, the sound of the trumpet, which said, come up hither, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately, now, have you ever thought of immediately, John went, from being here to there. Have you ever noticed when it comes to space, a lot of times they measure things in light years? God didn't, didn't even bother with the speed of light. 
it was immediate. In other places, if you look at that and you look at the, uh, the Greek, it's in, it's, <laughs> it happens in an atom of time. An atom of time. The smallest division of time. Think of it, the speed of light don't even get there. Okay? He went from here to there immediately. He didn't have to wait 100,000 light years or whatever. No, he was there immediately. Guess how fast a rapture is going to happen? Immediately. And immediately I was in the spirit, and be, uh, behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he that sat was to look like unto a jasper, a jasper, uh, a, think of a diamond, transparent, It, but in this case, it, it's bright. It, think of it as reflecting a lot of light, like a diamond with all the cuts. And you look at it, and you can see all the light. And uh, now, if you look at this in the Old Testament, it's Sardis. But here, it looks like sardine stone, all right? It's, it's, uh, I think I've heard people call it a sardin. Stone, what is that? It's a blood red stone. So when they looked upon him, he's blood red, but yet transparent. The blood, whenever we see him, we're reminded of the blood when we see him, even on his throne. In heaven, we will be, can you imagine a billion years from now, we're going to know the blood. for us. And that's what John saw. And there was a rainbow. I know some of you know this, if not all of you. What is the rainbow a symbol of? God's promise, right? God made a promise that he would not. So it symbolizes a promise. So here we have the blood symbolic of the blood, then we have a symbolic of a promise. In the Old Testament, the promise was a coming Savior. God kept his promise, and we are the beneficiaries of that. So there's a rainbow. When they look at the throne, they see a rainbow, and there was a rainbow round about the throne, in sight like unto an emerald. It's a rich green color, a green rainbow. Hmm. And it's around it. Not, not this way. It's around it. Very unusual. I've read that green in the biblical context represents Bountifulness, hope, and victory of life over death. So as they're looking, they see the blood. They see a rainbow of promise. And now they've got the victory of life over death. All in God's presence. As they're looking, this is what they're seeing. When we see him, we are reminded of his finished work on Calvary on our, our behalf. This must have been a spectacular sight that John saw. And it all pointed right back to the finished work of Christ on our behalf. This is, remember, this is the heavenly church service. When we come together, do we do we come because of the blood and of God's promise and his redemption for us? Do we come with this even in our, in our thoughts? We're to be a thankful people. For what? For one thing, what we just looked at. 
Verse 4. And round about the throne were twenty and four seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. These elders represent us. We too. Wasn't it uh, somebody that a few weeks ago said that we were almost like an arm's length from God's throne? Wasn't there one of the missionaries or somebody not too long ago that said that? I don't know if we're going to be that close. But we're going to be able to see the throne of God from all of heaven. Can we see it from here? Does your heart see it? How thankful are we? Verse 5, And out of the throne proceeding lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. Man, what an awesome sight. Could you just imagine John throwing himself to the ground? Oh, God, have mercy on me. Seeing him like this. It's pretty amazing seeing John as the one who leaned upon his breast when they would eat. He was the one closest to him, and now he sees him in glory. Man, what a sight. And yet, we have people that claim to be believers that won't even show up to church. What's wrong with us? Verse 6, And before the throne was, a, was there a, a sea of glass, like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne, and round about the throne, were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. I could just imagine that <laughs> the sea of glass reflecting, I mean, you got the lightnings, you got God being transparent and giving off. He's the light of heaven. So, I mean, he's producing just light to light up all of heaven. <sighs> I don't know. And before that, do you remember what Satan's job was? Lucifer, before he fell, was to reflect the glory of God. So if you got God's throne, like right here, just this is my mind's eye. You've got Satan spreading his wings, Lucifer, son of the morning, spreading his wings behind him and reflecting God's glory to all of heaven. He missed out. He can do that no more. Now God has a crystal sea laid before him. Was it there before? I don't know. But I do know one thing. That thing is reflecting God, and God is the light of all heaven. Can you, I mean, heaven's going to be a big place, and yet he lights the whole thing. There is no night. And with all this, we can't find time to go to a service for an hour. As we read these verses, I'm not going to do too bad on time. As we read these verses, did you notice that uh, John never said anything about seeing any other saints? or the prophets of old. Nothing about Moses. Nothing about Abraham or anyone else. Why do you think that is? Because our center of attention on all of this is not so I can ask David how he felt after Bathsheba or you know something else. 
No, Christ is the center of attention. We are his body. We've been looking at a heavenly church service. Do you think maybe we are lacking just a little bit? And like I said earlier, what's the difference between a, now I'm not talking about churches that run on emotion, but I'm talking about a sound biblical church that is alive and one that is dead. It's all about the heart of the individual believers. Do I have a hunger for my God? Do I praise him? Do I worship him from my heart? And then, if I do that individually, when we come together, do you know what three or four people in a church can do to a church that have a heart like that? They affect the whole body. The whole body catches on fire. I go to this church because it's by far the strongest church in this area. But do we have work to do? You betcha. And if you don't think so, you need to re-examine your heart. We do have work. You and I are his body, and we're to be here to worship him. Are there going to be things I don't like? Absolutely. Have there been things I have not liked since I've been here? Absolutely. But you know what? This is where my God brought me to worship. And I don't think I'm going to run away unless you all chase me out of here. All right? Unless God says, Ron, I need you somewhere else. I need you to go over wherever. But until God tells me to move again, I'm not moving. We're his body, you and I, together. Do we worship like that? Is our worship somehow like what we just looked at in heaven? I think we're lacking. He is to be the center, not Pastor Mac, not Marty singing, leading the singing, not myself teaching Sunday school, or we're not to be the center of anything. Christ is. Paul, man, if there was a man of God that I would, boy, let, I want to go spend the afternoon with Paul kind of thing. You know what, but follow me as I follow Christ. Paul, Paul, it would have been really easy for Paul to make himself a big shot. But what did Paul say? I'm the least. What are you? We're just believers struggling along to honor our God together as a body. That's what we're supposed to be doing. And I think we could do a little better if we'll just dedicate our hearts to it, spend more time with him, and come together with not a fake excitement, but to get our heart, our head screwed on straight I'm going to spend eternity being reminded of what he did for me. And he kept his promise. Are we going to be his living body on earth in these last days, or are we not? May we close in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord God, we thank you so much for your faithfulness to us. My God, I thank you and praise you for your word that encourages us, strengthens us, gets after us sometimes. But Lord, we need it. Spirit of God, I pray that you would stir us up. Lord, help us to be hot after you. 
Lord, help us to be excited for you. May our hearts burn for you. And may the world see you in me, in us. God, may we be for your good pleasure. Thank you so much. In Christ's name, amen.